I have a few remarks that I want to uh, share with you that I think God put on my heart. And the um, good news or maybe bad news for you is um, you don't have to prove them, second them, or vote on them. Uh, but I do ask that you go away and weigh them. I think that would be important. Before I get there, I just have three things uh, briefly just to um, call your attention to. One is I thought you might be interested in knowing how the services are going on Sundays. Uh, we have three now at 9, 11, and 6 like we used to. And with the 15% capacity, we're allowed roughly 164, give or take. And uh, as of last Sunday, we're pretty much full in all three services. So that's a great encouragement. Um, and I think they're going really well. It, you know, it's just nice to be together and to be in the presence of God. And I'd love it if you forced us to go to a fourth service. Uh, there's no limit on number of services we can have. So we're, last Sunday, we're looking at between five and 600 people that were actually here, which is a great thing. Uh, I choose to be thankful for that rather than complain. Talked to a pastor friend in BC this afternoon, and they haven't met for one year, and they can't even meet in their homes. And uh, last night, there was a call with Dr. Hinshaw and Mr. Kenny with pastors, and the point, one of the points that um, Premier Kenny made, which is a good point, was that uh, really it, it's, we're an exception across Canada, Alberta. He's doing everything he can to allow us to meet. And I'm grateful for that. And it's just a really good thing. So if you can come out Sundays, uh, come on out. And if we have to have, do another service, we'll figure out where to put it. But uh, it's, been, it's been a good experience for us so far. Now, when you came in tonight, I don't know if you noticed the flags are at half mast. They were at half mast uh, yesterday, today, and they'll, they'll go back up tomorrow. But the reason for that is uh, this week in 1988, was the week when the abortion laws were struck down in the Supreme Court of Canada. Henry Morgenthaler took them to court. Up until that point, abortion was illegal in Canada. And now it can be pre performed at any point in a woman's pregnancy. And that means that since 1988, uh, literally millions of little babies in Canada have never seen the light of day. And uh, they're just, the flags are down. They'll be down every year this week so that we remember to grieve. Uh, God, God does not take lightly the shedding of innocent blood. He cannot overlook it. And Ezekiel says that God looked for his people that would grieve and mourn the sin done in the land and put a mark on them and set them apart. It's so important to him that his people grieve sin. And so that's why it's that way. And I trust this week you would take some time to again come humbly before the Father and on behalf of our nation confess our sin and pray that God would do a new thing in our land. That's why the flags are down at half-mast. And then the, the third thing I should say is we, as you know, just before COVID hit, we finished the new foyer and kind of the, the updates in here. And that was a wonderful thing that we got that done. It's a wonderful thing we didn't go in the ground uh, because we'd still be in the ground um, waiting for what would happen next. But you know, the amazing thing is um, that God allowed us to pay the whole thing off. And so we have this beautiful foyer, this beautiful facility that we're enjoying. And we didn't make it the social distance. It works that way. We didn't make it for that. We'll get to use it like it was meant to be used one day. But all that to say, we've tried to put together, it is a really good video our communications department has put together on a phase 4A. Some of the stories behind it, the financial details, I think you'd be really encouraged if you watch that video. It's on our website. You can go on there and you can see it there. And I just wanted to note that for you as well. This afternoon, I had a young man um, talk to me on Zoom, and we'd set up an appointment. And he'd asked if he could interview me a bit and ask some questions for a project that he was working on. He's from another city. And I said, sure, I, I don't mind doing that. And he said, what do you think, uh, Christians, what do you think is the biggest challenge for Christians today in Canada? I thought, what a great question. And so I want my remarks to kind of come out of what I said to him because I think they're relevant not only for him, but for all of us, myself included, that you know that we're living in unprecedented times. And we've had a vision as a church to give everyone in central Alberta an opportunity to have a relationship with Christ. And in normal times, that's been good. We've prayed, we've had minute longer conversations, hope we've opened our homes and got to know our neighbors, things like that. But you know, we need to, we need to go to a whole new level right now because we're living in unprecedented times. The pandemic we're in has gone worldwide and there's virtually no person on the planet that hasn't been touched by it. That's very, very significant. It's interesting because if you read Jesus' take on the end times in Matthew 24, he'll talk about pestilences. 
And pestilences are plagues that go right around the planet and leave virtually nobody untouched. That's what we're in right now. And I believe that what God is trying to do is get the world's attention. Um, he's trying to uh, get people to understand that science and technology can't save us, and they won't. Um, only God can save us. And he's trying to get the attention of the world in some very dramatic ways. People have said, you know, where's God in all this? And my answer is he's right in the middle of all of it. He's actually right in the middle of it. People say, well, God doesn't cause bad things, does he? And I say, read your Bible. Read, let me read you something from Amos chapter 3. Now, because um, in a world that we're in, we're not supposed to have group meetings. So we had worship. Now I'll read you scripture. So it's a church service with a bit of business thrown in. <laughs> Listen to what God says to people in Amos' day. He says, many times I struck your gardens and vineyards. I struck them with blight and mildew. Locusts devoured your fig and olive trees, yet you've not returned to me, declares the Lord. I sent plagues among you as I did to Egypt. I killed your young men with the sword along with your captured horses. I filled your nostrils with the stench of your camps, yet you've not returned to me, declares the Lord. We need to be careful when we say that God doesn't allow or, is, or even God isn't responsible for things like this because he, he often does things like this. And he does it to get the world's attention, to turn people back to himself. Um, God, doesn't, um, God doesn't willingly bring harm on people, but he'll do what it takes to turn people's hearts back to himself because he knows that the, the eternal destiny of millions and millions of people is literally at stake. And so he's trying to get the world's attention, but I also believe he's trying to get the church's attention. And, and let's bring it right down to the micro level of Crossroads Church. He's trying to get our attention. The challenge before us is formidable, and we've never been this way before, and we'll never return probably to the normal that we once knew. We're going to find out very soon whether our faith is real, genuine, or not. And it's a time of testing we're in. We become far too casual with a holy God that we barely know. Let me say that again. We become far too casual with a holy God that we barely know. So God is trying to not only get the world's attention, but he's actually trying to get our attention. With the world as it is, I think if you think about these unprecedented times, I would add this. We are living in a day with unprecedented opportunities to show to the world authentic Christianity, real Christian faith what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ, the real, the genuine, the true. Um, and I want to share with you three things that are so critical if the world's going to see the real deal. But first, let me just say this. In order to get there, as Christians, we've got to park. We've just got to park our wild conspiracy theories. Those are ridiculous. They're nonsense, and they don't help anybody. So we've got to park that stuff. And then we've got to learn to step outside the world of our rights and into the world of our responsibilities. That's so important. And then we've got to learn to listen again to the Holy Spirit. Jesus said the Holy Spirit would be a counselor. He'd be someone that would convict the world of sin and judgment and righteousness to come. That he would actually be a guide. That he would, he would actually tell us things to come. He would tell us the future, Jesus said. We've never been this way before. So to listen to the Holy Spirit will become critical in terms of the next steps that we take, because only he knows where we go. So those things are foundational to what I want to say. Um, you know, when, when, uh, when, you, when you think back to the last two or three weeks and the disaster in Washington, D.C., and the storming of the Capitol building, what is most disturbing about all of that was the Jesus save signs, the crosses and Bibles and other symbols of Christianity. You've got a whole lot of people now saying, is that Christianity? Talking to another man today, and he said that he had someone come to him and say, is that what you guys believe? And we can get smug about that and say that's them and not us. But, you know, when you listen to what Christians are saying in Canada and what some churches are doing, we're not, not removed at all. It's just maybe not as public. And the world is looking and saying, so what is the real deal? That's why I say we have an unprecedented opportunity right now to display to Red Deer and Central Alberta what it really means to follow Jesus Christ. Let me give you three marks, unmistakable marks of authentic Christianity. They're not new to you. I hope the Holy Spirit runs a highlighter through them. Number one is love. Number one is love. 
I'm assuming that we follow Jesus and that we love him. But let me, let me tell you where, where we need to start loving at a whole deeper level. We need to start loving our enemies. We need to learn to love our enemies. Jesus said, love them. Pray for those that despitefully use you and persecute you. Love them. Love your enemies. You know, we have a wealth of literature available to us today, and I, I read a lot of it from the early church, the first two or three hundreds in the early church. Um, and, you know, it was a time of intense persecution and martyrdom and people being carted off to jail, churches destroyed, people couldn't gather uh, for fear of whatever. And yet here's the most amazing thing about all that literature that comes out of the first 300 years. You won't find anything, any imprecatory literature there at all. Zero, none. No imprecatory literature. You know what imprecatory is? That's to um, speak evil, call evil down, call curses down on other people. And yet they're being martyred. They're being held back from meeting together. Families are ripped apart. You won't find anything of an imprecatory nature. That's astounding. And it's not the way it is today. Christians on social media, uh, are, that we're filling our social media with imprecatory stuff, calling down curses, evil, bad thoughts on our leaders, political, on each other because we don't agree with our view on vaccines or masks or things like that. Um, that's not the kind of Christianity that's going to go anywhere. The Christianity that's authentic and real, first of all, loves enemies. Um, we, we, um, we do that with people that disagree with us, even in the Christian church. We love them. We love them. We treat them with respect. Um, love your neighbors. There's, there's another thing in love. You know that one. Uh, practical service, laying down our lives for our neighbors. Um, we, take, we, we ought to be taking more interest in our neighbors than in ourselves. We ought to be more concerned in Red Deer with the last, the lost, the least, the little, and the nearly dead than whether I can go to Earl's or not. Um, but that's really not the case. We're so preoccupied with our own stuff that we can't see the broken in our own city and the broken that don't look broken that live beside us sometimes in the streets in which we live. Um, we pray. We pray for three people, I hope, every week that don't know Jesus. I, I want to tell you, um, in prayer one day, the Lord laid strongly on my heart to say to you, don't give up. Don't give up. You've been praying a long time for people, and you don't see it. Don't give up. The day is coming when God's going to move in power, and a lot of the people that we've prayed for are going to come and be swept into his kingdom. Don't give up praying. It matters, and it's getting the attention of heaven. And Jesus is moving in ways that you don't understand, and I don't understand in people's lives. So loving our enemies, loving our neighbors, and then loving our brothers and sisters. Jesus said, they'll know we're Christians by the love that we have for one another. The Christian church in Canada, in Alberta, and at Crossroads is sadly divided over the most foolish things, whether we put a piece of cloth over our face or not, uh, whether we take a vaccine or not, uh, whether we believe that, uh, you know, some ridiculous theory that's out there. Um, that, that's all, that's all, like, that, that should be swept aside. The, the basis of our unity is not what we believe about different. The basis of our unity is our common life in Jesus Christ. I can fellowship with anybody that says Jesus is Lord. And my job as a Christian follower of Jesus Christ and loving my neighbor is to recognize that not everybody's going to agree with me, but I treat them with respect. I listen to them and, and I give them the freedom to make their choices. I said one line in one video update that what if, what if just what if, what if God actually touched some scientists and very smart people, smarter than me, and allowed a vaccine to come forward in nine months, and you would not believe the mail I got? Um, that's all I said. What if we thank God for that? So, you know, what I need us to do is just listen, treat each other with respect, give each other the freedom to make the choice. Some people don't want to come, and that's okay. Some people want to come. That's good. Some people don't wear masks. Some people do. You know, we're, our unity is based on our common life in Jesus Christ, not what we believe about a whole lot of other matters. So that's the first mark, love. The second mark is life, life. What I mean by that, I don't just mean lifestyle. Lifestyle, yes, but lifestyle comes out of life. What I mean by life 
is the experience of living water. Do we have it? Or do we just talk about it and read about it and teach about it? Have we experienced the life that Jesus came to give? Jesus said it would be like living water that would spring up in us. In fact, you wouldn't be able to contain it. It would actually go out and hit everybody else around you. Have, do we have that? Do we have that kind of life? Uh, it's, it's a kind of life that um, it brings together word and deed so that ultimately there's no slippage between word and deed. That's the real deal. It's an attractive life. Um, it's the kind of life that other people are looking for. It's the kind of life where, now this is, you got to get this. This is literally true. It's the kind of life where there's no fear. No fear. Where there's great hope. Where there's peace, where there's joy. We have to ask ourselves if we have that kind of life. It's so critical. I think Jesus wants to save a lot of Christians. I think he wants to give them life. You know, I know Christians that'll be in heaven for six or seven hours before they even know they're in heaven. You know why? They're walking so close to Jesus now and are experiencing the life of the ages now in his presence that it'll just be a continuation. They won't even know they're in heaven for the first six or seven hours. They got so much of it right now. Um, you know, if, if we lived that kind of life, it would be contagious and infectious and people all around us would want it. I, I think Titus kind of packages it in a different way and he says, live an attractive life um, and that, that's a beautiful thing. The third thing I'd just say is a great mark. You know, I tried hard to come up with another L, love life, but I didn't. Um, but I think the third great mark is an unshakable confidence in the word of God, an unshakable confidence in the word of God, so that we're prepared to take a stand on it in all matters of life and godliness, including sexuality, including all the great issues. They, we, we take our stand on the word of God and we'll live or die with that. We're prepared to say that we believe that God is well able to deliver on every promise he ever made. And that's our, that's our stand. It's an unshakable confidence in the word of God, which obviously means we read it. We meditate on it. Meditating, by the way, just um, it's a thought on that. Meditating, someone asked me today what that was about. I said, meditating, it always has an eye to application when it comes to biblical meditation. So you, you take the Lord as my shepherd, I lack nothing. And you're going to drive down the highway and meditate. On, you're, going to, you're going to ask the questions, how does, this, how does this impact my life? What does this mean for me? Meditation always has application as its goal. But that then leads to this unshakable confidence in the word of God. Listen, it's true. It's real. It works. And we got to be prepared to live and die with it. We really do. Now, why do I tell you these things tonight? Because I believe this with all of my heart. There's nothing I believe deeper than this, that God is preparing to do a great work in our world that will be greater than almost anything he's ever done before, a tremendous outpouring of his Holy Spirit. He's preparing that right now. You know, in, in um, the, uh, I guess, the late 1700s and spilled over actually into the 1800s, there was what was called the Second Great Awakening on the East Coast of the United States where God poured out his spirit and revival and masses of people came into the kingdom. We've not had a third great awakening, but the third great awakening will be greater than anything yet. And you, it'll change the landscape so dramatically that with COVID and what God is going to do, there won't be any returning to normal. Uh, there'll be so many people coming to Christ. I believe millennials will be converted by the tens of thousands, Muslims by the hundreds of thousands. That'll stir up what um, Romans talks about the nation of Israel becoming jealous. And you'll see Israel turn to Christ. The world will never be the same. And what he's preparing to do is going to happen soon and suddenly. That's why it's so critical that we're prepared and ready. I, have, I don't have any doubt that God will quickly marginalize Crossroads Church. We'll, we'll be a spectator in what's happening unless we're prepared to make the shifts to love, to get a hold of the life that's really life, and to put our faith unashamedly in the word of God. Um, unless we do that, we'll be spectators in what God's going to do. I just wanted to share that with you tonight. You weigh it. You're wise people. Um, weigh it before the Lord. Ask the Lord if these things are right. But if they are, then we have no choice but to kick it up a whole lot of levels. And that starts with me. So I wanted to share that with you tonight and uh, leave that with you.